Okay, we've reached that magical 7 p.m. Uh, program here at Poplar Creek Public Library. Welcome everybody here in the library and welcome everyone who's joining us remotely at, to our library. So thank you all for coming to our program, Harvard Computers. And after this is over with, just a bit of housekeeping, we're gonna send the remote uh, people a small survey that the people in-house have. It's exactly the same survey. Please uh, take the time to fill it out and send it back to us. We have some wonderful upcoming programs, uh, Keto 101, John Lennon Solo Years, South African Safari with the Tri-Village uh, Garden Club. We have online trivia, just uh, the whole balance of things that we think you will enjoy. And uh, if you have other programs that you're interested in, please on the survey let us know, because we do take them very seriously. But for our program today, we are going to be uh, in listening to a very instructional uh, presentation about the Harvard computers. Our presenter is Sally Laurent Nielsen. She's the associate chair in the Department of Physics at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Poplar Creek Public Library already has a connection to our speaker. Her aunt and uncle used to live in Streamwood, so she knows us, she knows our area. So this is perfect. At the University of Wisconsin-Madison Astronomy Department, she worked on one of the instrument teams for the Hubble Space Telescope. So she knows her stuff. She's <laughs> a senior lecturer at the Illinois Institute of Technology. She teaches physics and she helped create the astronomy major at ITT. She enjoys membership in Science Alliance. And that brings scientists into elementary schools for the kids. She's a teacher on the south side of Chicago, so she loves baseball. And she's an avid, avid reader of uh, Shakespeare. So with all these pieces and other personal pieces that she can share with you if she chooses, I would like to welcome Sally to teach, tell us about the, uh, these wonderful women that are over here, up here who worked in Edward Pickering's laboratory in the early 1900s. And they started the stellar astrophysics field. So Sally, thank you so much for presenting to Poplar Creek and I'll let you have the floor. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Harding. I'm very happy to be with everyone today. Um, so um, uh, as Ms. Harding said, I am currently faculty at the Illinois Institute of Technology that's on the south side, um, literally um, within a baseball's throw from um, let's just say the new Kaminsky Park because it changes its name so often. Um, I think we're guaranteed right field right now. I'm not sure. It keeps changing its name all the time. So I'll just call it new Kaminsky. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, um, yeah, a couple years ago, we started an astrophysics program there and I'm the only astrophysicist in the department. So that means I get to teach a lot of astronomy classes. But one of my other passions is uh, really sort of the history of science and of course in particular astrophysics. And I've become very, very interested in um, some of the early women pioneers in astrophysics. So that's what I was hoping to talk to you a little bit about today. All right, Ms. Harding already told you a little bit about myself, but I'll just recap. Um, I'm what's called a senior lecturer. Uh, Department of Physics, Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, my undergraduate degree was from UW-Madison, so that means I was born and raised in Wisconsin. And then I went off to Penn State to get my doctorate degree. Right after that, um, I moved to California and I did a postdoc there for a few years uh, doing some radio astronomy work. And uh, then after that, I moved to Chicago. So I started in Wisconsin, moved to Pennsylvania, went to California, actually went to Colorado a bit in between, and then came back to Chicago. So <laughs> I kind of went around the country a little bit and then ended up like 100 miles from where I grew up. Um, I'm the f actual former associate chair. I stepped down in, in June. So just very recently, I stepped down from being associate chair. And as Ms. Harding said, I teach a lot of the early physics classes for engineer and science majors. I even teach a class that's uh, not for science majors, but Illinois Institute of Technology has a very big architecture program. Some of you will probably know about Mies van der Rohe. 
uh, former um, uh, faculty member at Illinois Tech, and so I teach a class that used to be called Physics for Architects, but we still call it that because the name is much more succinct than what it's called now. Um, and then, like I said, I'm the only astrophysicist in the department, so that means I teach a whole lot of astrophysics courses for the juniors and seniors who are majoring in it. All right, so we're going to concentrate on a small subfield of astrophysics um, today, stars. That's actually not what I do research on. I actually research um, certain types of galaxies, but um, as an astrophysicist, I still know um, a little bit about stars. Um, so let's just start with the very basics. Let's start with what's, what is a star? We all know a star. We are all very good, I hope, on very good terms with a star called the sun, but of course there are hundreds of millions and billions of stars in the universe. So let's define what one is. A star is a body made of gases, and it becomes a star when it has a high enough temperature, density, and pressure in its very center that nuclear fusion reactions can occur there. And stars, because they are gas, they need a very high central temperature and pressure in order to support themselves against gravitational collapse. Because it's a gas, which with a lot of mass, if there was nothing to stop the inward pull of gravity, stars would just collapse into nothing. That collapse is halted by an inward, uh, very high pressure and temperature. It just so happens that in some gaseous bodies, those things that we call stars, the central temperature gets high enough that we can actually take hydrogen atoms and fuse them into helium. So the basic reaction that the sun does something like 100 trillion trillion times every second is that it takes four hydrogen atoms and makes from it a helium atom, sort of like alchemy, right? We're turning one element into another. And in the process, it also releases some photons. It releases light, light in the form of heat and light also in the form of sunlight. And then a couple of little um, small particles called neutrinos. Okay, so one of the basic things that you have to always do when you're doing astronomy is when you find some new object that you want to study, you want to know how bright is it? Not how bright does it appear, but how bright is it? How bright something actually appears will be a function of how bright it really is and how far away it is. So I don't want to say, oh, that's a dim thing, but it's really not. It's just a bright thing very far away. So the way that astronomers talk about how intrinsically bright something is, is we talk about its luminosity. So you want to know how bright it intrinsically is, its luminosity. You'd like to know how hot it is. You'd like to know how much mass it has. You'd like to know how big it is physically, right? What's its radius? And then when you get a little more sophisticated, you might actually want to figure out how it changes with time. So it's evolution. How are they born? How do they live their lives? If their bodies that die, how do they die? How do they end their lives? So over the last 150 years or so, we've come to realize that stars have a huge range in all these properties in how bright they intrinsically are, how hot they are, how much mass they have, how big they are, and actually how long they actually live especially if we include stars that have died. So here's just a little caption. You're only seeing a small fraction of the sun here, and here's the Earth in relative comparison, and there are some dead stars called white dwarfs and neutron stars, which are about the size of the Earth, which means very tiny compared to the sun. And then there are some dead stars which are extremely tiny, and they're called neutron stars. They're about the size of the greater Chicago area, and they're still stars. The sun itself is actually a pretty wimpy star. Other stars out there in our own galaxy are actually quite a bit bigger. So our star is kind of middle of the road. So how do we come to know all this, right? How do we come to know how bright stars are and what their temperature are and what they're made of and how much mass they have? Well, it starts really with Edward Pickering and his late 19th and early 20th century cadre of women, mostly, that have been come to known as the Harvard computers. 
Now, if any of you saw the film or read the book, uh, Hidden Figures, which is about the women scientists who worked at NASA um, during the Apollo program, these Harvard computers are sort of the um, early 1900s equivalent of the women in Hidden Figures. So stars are, duh, right, distant, and their temperature, mass, size, and intrinsic brightness cannot be easily measured. Right? That's what I always tell my students, that, that astronomy is a little bit of a strange science because some of the most basic things you want to know are some of the hardest things to measure, like how many kilograms is that? Right? How, how much mass does it have? You can't just go there and take a big scale and weigh things. Or how, 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 what's its radius? What's its diameter? You can't take a giant tape measure and go to a star and measure it. So most other things in physics you can take into a lab and measure. But astronomy, you can't. All you can do is sit back with a telescope and observe. You can't actually go there and measure things. And that makes measuring these things really hard. So it's even really hard to figure out what they are made of, right? Are they mostly hydrogen, helium, copper, iron? You know, what are they made out of? So Edward Pickering was obsessed with trying to figure out what stars are made of and how big they are and how bright they are. And so he did what every good astronomer would do, which is do a survey. Look at a whole bunch of stars. And he used what was in the early 1900s a really new technique to measure something called the spectra of stars. So you all know if you take light and you send it through a prism, you can break it up into its component colors, right? White light becomes a rainbow. Well, if you do that on an even finer scale so that you even don't just have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but you look very carefully at the red part and the orange part, then you have what's called a spectrum. And in the early 1900s, there was a new technique developed by a man named Henry Draper to capture those spectra on photographic plates, right? This is the early 1900s. We didn't have things like fancy CCD cameras, which we all carry around in our phones now. But even, you know, the scientists of the early 1900s didn't have anything that sophisticated. They had those big old fashioned glass plates. And when Henry Draper died, his widow, Mary Palmer Draper, who was quite, quite wealthy, funded Edward Pickering for decades um, in, order to in order to facilitate his, his survey that he was trying to do with the ultimate goal of creating a giant catalog of all the stars visible in our galaxy. And that catalog is still used today and is called the Henry Draper Catalog. But there are lots of stars in our galaxy, and there were lots and lots of these spectra of stars to take, and so Pickering couldn't do it on his own. He needed basically readers. He needed people to sort through the data and organize it in some kind of way before you could interpret it and figure out what it was telling you. So that brings us to the initial two Harvard computers, Antonia, Mar Antonia Mari. She was the niece of Henry Draper, and she graduated from Vassar with degrees in astronomy, physics, and philosophy, combining ph philosophy with the sciences in, in that era was not uncommon. And she studied under Maria Mitchell. And if you know a little bit about the history of astronomy, you may have heard of her. There's actually um, a telescope named after her, the Maria Mitchell Telescope. She, so she was another early female pioneer of um, astrophysics in the United States. And then the other woman, who's really in on the ground floor of all this is Wilhelmina Fleming. And unlike Antonio Murray, she did not really have a formal background in science. In fact, she was Edward Pickering's maid. And as the story goes, and I love to tell this story, Edward Pickering originally had his male postdocs looking through some of the data. And he would come and check on them every once in a while and say, how you go, how you guys doing? You know, have you sorted through spectra? Have you kind of organized, have you made any kind of cataloging system yet? And they'd be bickering about this and that and the other thing. And this went on and on and on. And finally, he went down one day and his postdocs had done nothing. And as the story goes, he shouted, my maid could do better than you people. And so he hired his maid and she did do better. 
Um, she took over Wilhelmina Fleming, the ex-maid, now astrophysicist, took over from Nettie Farrar, who was another person who worked very early on with Antonio Murray doing the classifications of all this data. Um, Wilhelmina Fleming, I love this little Chicago connection, actually advocated that there be um, uh, a recruitment of female astrophysicists in a rather famous speech, at least to us female astrophysicists, uh, that she gave at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So a little Chicago connection there. All right, but what exactly were they reading? So the, what they were reading were what astronomers called spectra. So spectra are, really, are, are, the, are the, what happens to light when you send it through a prism and you break it up into its component colors. But like I said, for an astrophysicist, you use a really, really, really detailed prism that can really break it up into its component colors in, in greater detail than, you know, the prism you can, you know, buy for yourself. So how does that help us? Well, the outer layer of the sun and any star is called the photosphere. And that's the layer from which the photons or the light actually leaves the sun and comes to us. It's all generated deep, deep, deep in the core of the sun where you have that fusion process going on where you're doing you know, astrophysical um, alchemy of turning four hydrogen into a helium. Those photons are generated in the center and then they take tens of thousands to possibly a million years for those photons to percolate through and get to the surface. Once they get to the photosphere, boom, that's when they leave the sun and they come out to us and they hopefully warm us on a nice summer day. So all stars have this outer layer from which the photons leave. And it turns out that this outer layer is actually the coolest layer in any star. And this thing called Kirchhoff's Laws says that any time you have a low density gas, and remember that's all stars are, they're gas, they're super, super hot, super, super um, high pressure, but at the very outer layers, they're actually a f relatively low density. They're, they're lower density than, than air. Um, so this low density outer layer gas of stars will produce what's called an absorption line spectrum. So this is what you probably think of when you hear the word spectrum, right? You hear, you see white light that gets separated into its component colors, those that are visible to the eye. But if you send that light through a cool layer of gas, you will see some very narrow bands of color are missing. That's what's called an absorption line. All right, so what are they telling us? That's the key to how we understand how hot stars are and um, what they are made of. These little tiny dark lines where part of the colors are missing. So to understand what they're telling us, we're going to have to do a little bit of exactly what, what is matter and how is it organized. So some basic facts, right? Matter consists of molecules. Molecules consist of atoms. And a single atom, like a hydrogen atom or a helium atom or a copper atom, consists of a nucleus, which is in the very, very center, and electrons. The nucleus consists of positively charged particles called protons and neutral particles called neutrons. And the electrons have much lower mass than these protons and neutrons, and they basically exist in a cloud kind of around the nucleus, and they have a negative charge. So there are only certain energies that these um, electrons can have. And we represent that in a diagram by saying the electrons can only be spaced at certain distances from the nucleus. The spacing isn't a real thing. It's just kind of a, the way we draw it in a picture. It's really representing the energies. So these electrons, which are very close to the nucleus, have very low energy. Those that are a little bit further away have more energy. Electrons that are further away have even more energy. So here we go again. There's a nucleus. The he, these, this little diagram, which looks like it's showing you distances the electrons exist from the center, is really showing you how much energy the electrons have. 
and electrons can only have certain energies, right? They can never be between any two energy levels. So if an uh, if an electron is, say, in this energy level, you know, moderate energy, and it loses a little bit of energy, unless it's enough to actually let it jump down here, then, then it's not allowed to lose that energy. It can't exist in between. The way I, I like to teach my students to think about it, it's like a, rat, a ladder with unevenly spaced rungs. So, you know, if you're climbing this ladder, you can be on this rung or this rung or this rung, and they're not evenly spaced, but you can't be halfway in between. So if you're down here and you want to get a higher energy or climb to a higher height, you have to get enough energy to jump all the way up here. You can't get halfway now and halfway later. You're either down here or up there. So in terms of electrons, you're either low energy, medium energy, high energy, super high energy. Okay, the higher the rung, the higher the energy. All right, so what does that have to do with spectra again? All right, so when there's an electron and it's on a low rung and a photon comes along, which has energy, that electron can absorb that energy and it can jump to one of the higher rungs on the ladder, provided that photon has the right energy that it won't put it in between the rungs. If, it, if that photon has just the right energy that will allow the electron to eat it up and climb the ladder, then that photon disappears and you see a dark line in the spectrum at the energy or wavelength or color, whatever word you want to use, where that photon used to be. So these lines were known to Pickering and Fleming and Mori and Nettie Farrar and they were called Fraunhofer lines. So here's a spectrum, right? Again, we've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, so white light divided up into a spectrum, but you can see it's just littered with all these little missing segments. And these missing segments correspond to energies where electrons in certain particular atoms have found a photon, absorbed it, jumped up to a level, and then the photon disappeared. There's no more light anymore. And these lines, these series of absorption lines, act like fingerprints, meaning that every single atom has a different set of energies or colors or wavelengths, whatever you want to use um, as the word, where they will be able to absorb photon energy. Other photon energies, hey, they won't absorb. Hydrogen doesn't want this energy, but maybe copper does, okay? And maybe, and where you actually have the light coming through, there are no atoms that want photons of the, that energy, and that's what gets through. So why are they useful? Again, every atom or molecule has a unique set of colors or unique set of energies that its electrons can absorb or emit. And then it gets even better, right? Here we have two different isotopes of carbon, carbon 12 and carbon 13. They're both carbon. The only difference is carbon 12 has six protons and six neutrons in its nucleus. Carbon 13 has six protons and seven neutrons, it has an extra neutron. And the colors that it will subtract from a spectrum are slightly different. So if you have a good enough instrument to tell the difference between these two colors, you not only know that, that the material is made of carbon, you know whether it's carbon 12 or carbon 13. And not only that, it depends how ionized the atom is. So it matters whether you have a neutral oxygen, you have an oxygen that has already had one electron stripped away or two electrons stripped away, they will all absorb different colors. So that's why it's like a fingerprint, right? The exact colors that are missing will change depending on what atom you have, what isotope of the atom you have, and how ionized any particular isotope of the atom is. So it's a really, really precise measure of what you have in the outer layer in the photosphere of a star. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's the physics bit. So let, let's get back to the women now. So 
uh, Wilhelmina Fleming looked at thousands of stellar spectra that were collected on these photographic plates with the technique that Henry Draper um, pioneered. And she categorized them, right? She's an ex-maid. She categorized, she cleaned, she decluttered, she organized, and she just divided them up. Oh, that's a type A, I'll call that a type B, and this is a type C, and a D, and an E, and an F, and she divided all these thousands into, I think the original classification went letters A through Q. Then, um, Maury added classifications based on the line width, so how much of the color was missing, a very narrow bit or a wider bit. And then, they actually went to the southern hemisphere and took thousands and thousands of more spectra of stars that are only visible from the southern hemisphere. Later, uh, someone who we will talk about called Henrietta Swan Leavitt invented something called that she called the fly spanker. <laughs> it's not a fly swatter because this was much more delicate. So these were called fly spankers. I just love that. <laughs> And what they were, you could see they were these little, I'll call them templates. So they had different examples of what is a type A and B and C and D on it. And then they would just hold up their fly spanker to some new spectra and they could easily compare and categorize very quickly. Along the way, they, they were just trying to categorize stars, but they found whole new categories of stars that no one knew existed. And some of these are extremely important, uh, even today. Uh, some dead stars called white dwarfs, uh, spectroscopic binaries, so they're stars that are orbiting double star systems, orbiting each other. They discovered supernovae. No one, no one knew that's, uh, what a supernovae was at the time. We now know they're exploding stars. Novi are stars with little mini explosions on their surface, and then other kinds of stars that vary their light output. All right, next woman is Annie Jump Cannon, who is probably the most distinguished of all the Harvard computers. So we have a picture, it took me a while to find this, to, a picture of her early in her life, and the ones you usually see of her are later in her life. And she refined a Mori system, dropping some of those A, B, C, D, E, F all the way through Q. Some of them she said they're redundant and she got rid of them. And so she ended up with a system that only had A, B, F, G, K, M, and O. There's a reason I didn't put it in alphabetical order and we'll get to that later. Um, she also did some of the work that Wilhelmina Fleming had done with how wide um, the missing color bands were. And she also put some transitional cases in. So it's not quite a G and it's not quite an F. It's kind of halfway in between. She was born in the U.S., but she was named an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society. And she was also the first female honorary, honorary doctorate recipient from Oxford. So in many ways, um, the UK recognized her contributions more than actually Harvard did. Um, it's said that in her, in her heyday, um, Annie Jump Cannon could classify three stars per minute, <laughs> which is pretty amazing, you know, a little fly spanker. 20 seconds per star, boom, 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 boom. And she'd do this for hours and hours and weekends and nights and yeah. All right, another really big figure among the Harvard computers is Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who I mentioned briefly. She, she was not so much interested in these uh, spectra, looking for the little bands of color that were missing, um, but she was more interested in how bright stars are. And she discovered many stars that would vary their brightness periodically, get bright and dim and bright again. And for a certain subclass, she called Cepheids, uh, she came up with a period luminosity relationship. So based on how quickly a star went from bright to dim to bright again, she could tell you how bright it intrinsically was, which again is a big deal. Because we don't know if a dim thing is dim because it's just intrinsically dim or if it's dim because it's really far away. But if we know how bright it intrinsically is, 
and we still see it as dim, but it's really, really bright, then we know something about its distance. And otherwise, that's really hard to measure in astronomy. So her period luminosity relationship, called the Levitt Law, uh, was used to get distances to little satellite galaxies around our own. And later, Harlow Shapley used that to actually measure the size of our own galaxy by using this, the class of stars that Henrietta Leavitt um, discovered and developed this, relation, this period luminosity relationship for. And then a little while after that, Edwin Hubble actually used Henrietta Swan Leavitt's findings to actually discover that there was such a thing as a Big Bang and the universe is expanding. So without Henrietta Leavitt, uh, Henry and Swan Lovett's work, um, Hubble would not have been able to discover that the universe began in the Big Bang. I also find it interesting to point out that both Cannon and Levitt had hearing loss. So, of course, being, you know, the early 1900s, um, it was relatively difficult for women to get jobs outside of um, um, seamstresses, clerical, secretary kind of work. So they were already kind of, you know, in the vanguard in being scientists, but they were also disabled. Um, they also uh, really effectively by the end of their lives had become deaf, and yet they were still very well uh, gainfully employed. So I think that's pretty inspiring. So the cadre of female um, Harvard computers classified, as I said, thousands and thousands of these stars used to be categories A through Q, but then Annie Jump Cannon threw some of them out. And what we were left with were just A, B, F, G, K, M, O, and some of the intermediates, like a G, halfway between a G and a K, and halfway between an A and a B, and that kind of stuff. So here is a astronomer's way of um, denoting a spectrum. So this is brightness versus color. And you can see there are certain colors where there are dips in the brightness, right? Those are the absorption lines. So this would be a classified as a type A. This would be a type G. Lots more of those little dips. Here's a type M, which looks extremely weird. We have lots of kind of broad bumps and wiggles in addition to uh, uh, dips. And then what Kate, uh, Annie Jump Cannon did is took all these types and she organized them into a sequence. So if you look at the top, you have O at the top and M at the bottom. And you can see how the spectrum here at the top slowly morphs into what you have at the bottom. So instead of A, B, C, you know, instead of going alphabetically, she decided the true sequence should go O, B, A, F, G, K and then M. And that's why I wrote it in that order earlier. Okay, so now let's move on to another one of my absolute favorite Harvard computers, Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. She was a, um, a decade or two after the, the other women we've talked about. She studied chemistry and physics at Cambridge. And um, I found out fairly recently um, that while her love was, was physics and chemistry, um, Gustav Holst himself tried to get her to study music, which I think is kind of ironic because Gustav Holst is the guy who wrote, you know, this probably, arguably, most famous work are the planets. And so I, I kind of think that's a kind of weird little astronomy music cl uh, connection there. Uh, Cecilia Pengapashkin worked with uh, Shapley at Harvard. Shapley is the person who followed Edward Pickering after Edward Pickering's death. And uh, Shapley had seen the work that the women um, under Pickering had done, and he decided he was going to start a PhD program, and he was going to admit women. So uh, Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin was one of the first women that he admitted into his PhD program in astrophysics at Harvard. Um, Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin had wanted to get her doctorate um, in the UK, you know, at Cambridge, where she had done her um, um, undergraduate work, but um, Cambridge said, no, sorry, women can't do that. So she took that OBAFGKM sequence that Annie Jump Cannon had figured out, and she said, you know why? 
O's slowly morph into B's, which slowly morph into A's and all the other types. It's because the temperature of that outer layer of the stars are slowly changing. Turns out O stars are stars that are super, super, super hot surfaces. And M stars are the ones that have the coolest surfaces. Now, even an M star is far hotter than, you know, Chicago in August. But relative to an O star, an M is quite cool. She then, in her doctoral work, showed that stars were actually made like 98% of stars are made of hydrogen and helium. It's about 70% hydrogen by mass, most stars, 28% helium by mass, and just 2% is all the other stuff. Calcium, iron, copper, manganese, fluorine, chloride, um, boron, all the other elements are only 2% of what's in stars. And that's remarkable, because at the time, people thought, well, the sun's made of the same thing the Earth is. The Earth is not 98% hydrogen and helium, right? The Earth has an iron core, and it has nickel, and there's silicon, and there's calcium, and that, all that stuff is just trace amounts in the sun. So that's what she showed in her thesis. However, Henry Norris Russell uh, read her thesis and persuaded her that mm, her conclusions were spurious. You know, okay, you got your PhD, but mm, we don't really believe this. Several years la later, Russell changed his mind. He did some of his own research and he realized that Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin was right after all. That stars in general are 98% hydrogen and helium, and all the other elements in the universe are just present in trace amounts. So another pretty famous um, astrophysicist called Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin's thesis, the most brilliant PhD ever written in astronomy. So, and she did that before she died. Okay, so she, she got the compliment before she died. Okay, so here we have our, our morphing of the different kinds of spectra from O type O to B to A to F to G to K to M, which Annie Jump Cannon organized. And Cecilia Pangaposhkin's thesis said, what this is, is a temperature sequence. Where the O's are hot, the M's are cool. And in case you're curious, our sun is a G. So we're on the cool end. Um, so Cecilia Pangaposhkin's work not only figured out that stars are 98% hydrogen and helium, but also figured out exactly what the temperatures of that outer layer are. She could actually measure the temperatures. Okay, nice, right? That's one of the things we'd like to know. When we look at a new object in astronomy, how big is it? How massive is it? What is it made of? How hot is it? But we still don't really know, based on the Harvard computer's work, how massive stars are and how big they are. Henrietta Swan-Levitt gave us some idea for some stars how bright they are. And uh, Cecilia Pangaposhkin gave us some idea of temperature and what they're made of. But what about how massive and how big they are? So the next two people in the story are eight, I never say his name right, Edgenar. I think it's Edgenar Hertzsprung and Norris, Henry Norris Russell, the same Russell that told Gaposchkin originally that he didn't believe her thesis. And what they did is they plotted these temperatures, which came out of Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin's thesis, and they plotted temperature versus um, um, intrinsic brightness, which they could get for some stars based on Henrietta Leavitt's work because she could measure intrinsic brightnesses. So they had to know distances, which came from Henrietta Swan Levitt's work. And so what we have here is what's called the HR or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that is, every astronomer knows like the back of their hand. What we have is brightness on this axis and temperature on this one. And like I tell my students, you would think that cool would be on the left and hot would be on the right, but astronomers like to do things backwards because it keeps people out of the club. 
So we put cool on the right and hot on the left. So stars are getting hotter as we move to the left and they're getting brighter as we move up. And when Hertzsprung and Russell plotted brightness versus temperature, they found that stars couldn't have just any brightness and any temperature. They found that there was sort of a clumping of stars, where if you knew the temperature, there was a, only a small range of brightness that that star could have. And this main clumping is called the main sequence. So it's a big deal because it tells us that stars organize their physical properties in a certain way and that there is a link between surface temperature and overall luminosity, right? If I give you a surface temperature of a star, it can't just have any luminosity. There's only a small range of luminosities it's likely to have. The diagram also then gives us a way to find the distance to any star not just the ones Henrietta Swan Levitz could find distances for, but any star. Because now we could just take a spectrum, use Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin's work, which tells us based on the missing, the pattern of the missing colors, what's the temperature of the star. And then we know how stars clump. So once we know the temperature, boom, we go up until we hit the main clump. And then we look over and we know it's 1 one hundredth the luminosity of our sun. Or we take a spectrum of another star and we find it, that one has the little bumps and wiggles that correspond to a star of 1,000 degrees Kelvin. We go up till we hit the clump and we find out, well, that star's 100 times the luminosity of our sun. So we have a way to measure the, the intrinsic brightness of any star now. And it also lets us figure out how big stars are. The last little missing, well, I guess not quite the last missing piece. We haven't done mass yet. So you take the spectrum of a star, you figure out its temperature, and then you use the HR diagram to get its brightness. And there's a really simple physics relationship between brightness, temperature, and radius. So if you know both the brightness and temperature, by using the formula, you can calculate the radius. And if you plot that on this diagram, there are these diagonal lines. So these diagonal lines are stars of different radii. This is a star. If a star lies along this diagonal line, it's the same radius as the sun. If it's above that, it's bigger. And if it's below that, it's smaller. And masses. It turns out that masses actually grow along this main sequence too. So as the stars get both hotter and brighter, they also get more massive. So here's our sun. It has one solar mass. Stars that are cooler and dimmer than us have less mass. Stars that are hotter and brighter than us have more mass. Okay. And there's more. <laughs> it turns out we can even determine how long a star is going to live based on the work that all these Harvard computers did. So remember that what's going on in the core of stars. Remember where sunlight comes from. It's alchemy, right? The sun is turning four hydrogen into a helium, and it does it 100 trillion trillion times every second. Well, that means you're running out of helium, right? If 100 trillion trillion times a, a second, you're taking four hydrogen and turning it into helium, you're eventually going to run out of hydrogen, even in something as big as the sun. And when you run out of hydrogen, you can't turn hydrogen to helium anymore, right? So that means the star's um, main lifetime, let's call it, will end. So that will signal, that's, I should read my own slide. Uh, this signals the beginning of the end of a star's life. Now it turns out that you would think the more massive stars, they just have more stuff, so they should last longer than the less massive stars, but that's actually not true. Um, the most massive stars, I like to say, live fast and die young. Yes, they have more stuff, they have more hydrogen, they have more helium, they just have more mass, but they literally burn through it more quickly, right? They're like the, they're like the Ferrari compared to the VW bug 
I guess that shows how old I am that I still know what a VW bug is. But so the VW bug is, yeah, it's a wimpier car, but it lasts a lot longer than a Ferrari does. A Ferrari's kind of, you know, live fast, die young, boom, then you're done. So a star like the sun will live for mm, 12, 14 billion years. A, sun, a star 25 times as massive as the sun lives for only 4 million years. A, sun, a star half as massive as the sun will live for 700 billion years, which is significantly older than the age of the universe. So basically the low mass stars for all practical purposes never die. They're here for, for a long time. So to wrap it up, the Harvard computer's legacy, what is, is what, we, what we today know about the size, the mass, the temperature, the life cycle of stars is attributable, directly attributable, attributable to the work these women did, including Antonia Murray, Wilhelmina Fleming, Nettie Farrar, Annie Jump Cannon. A few women that I didn't have time to talk about are Anna Whitlock, Selena Bond, Rhoda Sauters, Florence Cushman, Evelyn Leland, and then of course I did mention Henrietta Swan Levitt and Cecilia Payne Gapashkin. And just to, I mean, I know this was the early 1900s, so we need to take into account an inflation, but still they were earning 25 to 50 cents an hour for their work, which at the time was more than factory work, but it was actually less than clerical work. But they did the work because they loved it. Right? They love being astrophysicists. So they revolutionized our study of the stars and our understanding of stars, and their work indirectly led to knowledge of the size, scale, and nature of our own galaxy. And even to, it is not at all a stretch to say that the work that these women did was instrumental in the whole idea of the Big Bang and that the universe began at a point in time with a massive um, explosion of space and time. And today, the highest prize in astrophysics given specifically to a woman is called the Annie Jump Cannon Award. And the very first recipient of the Annie Jump Cannon Award was Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. <laughs> if you find this stuff interesting, I highly, highly recommend this book called The Glass Universe by Dava Sobel. I figure I'm talking to a bunch of people who are coming to a library talk. So pointing out good books is probably not gonna fall on deaf ears. Um, this is an excellent book. And in fact, most of Dava Sobel's books are really, really good. Um, uh, she wrote a book called Galileo's Daughter, which is very good. She wrote another one called Longitude, which is very good. This one, The Glass Universe. And there are a couple others whose titles are escaping me at the moment. But if this particular story is of interest to you, The Glass Universe is a really, really good book. So I will be happy to hang around, answer any questions after this. But before I do that, I just want to give my thanks to Ms. Harding and to the Poplar Creek Public Library. Um, also to Dava Sobel for her book. Um, when I read it, I found a whole bunch of other little, you know, pieces of information that I was not aware of. Uh, my astrophys astrophysics students at Illinois Tech always inspire me to kind of learn these stories and pass them on to them. And then, of course, you. Um, I want to thank you very much for participating and joining me in this talk. So thank you very much. Um, I think we have about 10 more minutes, so I'm happy to hang around and answer questions. But thank you very much. So I don't know if you guys want to, if, if you're able to unmute and ask questions, or if you'd like to type things into the chat, or people in the room would like to ask questions and pass it on. You're welcome. Thank 
Thank you so much, Sally. We appreciate it. You're welcome. I had fun. I hope everyone found this was a good way to spend a Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any other questions in the chat. So does anybody have anybody? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you. You're welcome.